Moldova. I had to look it up. I didn't, Moldova. She saw this little face on a, on a, on a program on the, one of the uh, stations there. I think it was on a PBS station. And she couldn't get that face out of her. her she became in purpose, on purpose. She began to live her life on purpose. She went to Moldova and brought home her little son. And it's like, whatever it is when you are of service, if you're giving your life away, and if you don't know how to do that, you, you suspend your ego. You, you understand that living on purpose means there's no accidents. That you're aligning yourself with purpose. You ignore other people when they tell you what you should be doing. That's what Ivan Illich didn't do. You just ignore it. You don't have to have a fight about it. You can say thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. It's very helpful. I've never thought of that before. <laughs> I'll consider that. That's how you handle all conflict. Can I join up with this source energy or can't I? The two, as soon as you start striking out, you're off of purpose. You have to contemplate yourself surrounded by the conditions you want to produce. That's the first face of intention. The second face of intention is one of my absolute favorites. I call it the face of kindness. It is my intention to be at peace with everyone in my life, including all of my relatives. <laughs> That's my intention. I insist that I will be at that place in my life. And so what, how do you do that? You have to, again, look at the resistance, look at the thoughts, and suggest to yourself, I am going to be, I am going to be kindness. Yesterday, we went to a movie. I came home from the movie, and there was a man on the street in Boston who was homeless. And he was mentally challenged, obviously. And, I, and he had a little cup, and he asked for some change. And I looked at him, and I always send a sort of a silent blessing to these people. And then um, I was walking, and I kept thinking, you're giving a talk tomorrow about kindness. And I went back, and I had about $4 worth of change in my pocket, and I had to chase him. He went downstairs someplace, and uh, he, uh, he was dirty, and he was, uh, you know, and he couldn't speak right. And, he, and I took this change, and I just took his cup, and I put it, and you'd have thought that I had given this man, you know, a million dollars. I mean, he, he followed me. He couldn't stop thinking. Tears were coming down. It's a simple little act of kindness. And I'm not suggesting to every single one of you that everybody who asks you for money, you are obliged to give them money. But can you give them a silent blessing? Can you give them a smile instead of looking for using them as a reason to be upset? And you have to, you know, folks, you got to do this with all of your, all of your uh, relatives as well, particularly your own children and your own parents. You got to look at them and see every time that I have a thought that is not one of kindness, what I am doing is I am leaving the source and taking on ego consciousness. Here's a fascinating piece of research. You know what serotonin is? Serotonin is like this neurotransmitter, this enzyme in the, in the body, in the brain. And the more of it that you have, the better you feel. It's the well-being feeling. And this well-being feeling is something that antidepressants are designed to stimulate. So that when you take these names that have become common out there, um, we, uh, <coughs> we associate this with they are designed to stimulate the production of serotonin. Serotonin is very difficult to measure. It's done through the metabolites in the urine. But they're getting, e they're getting better at measuring it. Here's a fascinating study that was just completed, that any person who is the recipient of an act of kindness has their serotonin levels increased just because they received an act of kindness and their immune system is strengthened because they received this dose of kindness. That's the recipient. And 
Secondly, any person who is the giver, the provider of an act of kindness, anything you ever do which is a providing an act of kindness, and that's, see, here's a universal source that can't be anything other than what it is. It can't be something foreign to itself. So it doesn't, it's, it's always creating, are you? It is always creating what it creates, treating it with kindness. Here, this is, this source can create worlds. <laughs> it creates, it creates planets and systems. And whether you look through the microscope or whether you look through the telescope, it's impossible to say which has the grander view. It's impossible to say because they all lead to infinity. And this is a source that creates worlds. It creates you. It doesn't, why would it create? It can create anything. Why would it create stuff that it's not kindly toward, like avocados? No thanks, I don't want an avocado. <laughs> why would it do that? It doesn't have to, it can create anything, this source, from which all emanates. If you, if you are the provider of an act of kindness towards anyone, but particularly towards the people that you're close to in your life, and particularly towards strangers with just a smile, or an act of kindness, or, you know, I can afford a quarter, I can afford a dollar, I'm gonna go back. And just, you know, and not making a big deal about it, the serotonin levels in you are increased in the same, to the same degree that they are in the receiver. And so is your immune system strengthened. You wanna strengthen your immune system? Be kind. But even more dramatic than that, I get excited about this. <laughs> Because this is what blows me away about, is that the observer of an act of kindness, the observer of an act of kindness has their serotonin levels and their immune system strengthened just because they're in the energy field of someone who is displaying kindness. When you see someone being kind to another person, it's like a dose of an antidepressant. It's like a serotonin rush. Very often in my talks, and I'll ask, who is the person out there in the audience who had someone buy your ticket because you couldn't afford it, and you couldn't afford to come here, and they paid your way to get here, and they just wanted you to be here because they felt it was so important that you be there. And someone will always raise their hand, I'll bring them up, and I'll say, so what did they spend? And they'll say, $100. They gave me $100, and they couldn't even afford it themselves. And I'll reach in my pocket, and I'll hand her the $100, and I'll say, could I extend to you this kindness back so that you can repay that person? And everyone, in the, you can see teeth that you couldn't see for the previous hour. Everybody is smiling and laughing and happy and excited, and all I, it cost me 100 bucks. You know how much antidepressant you'd have to take? That's, that's $10,000 worth of pills, and you gotta call your doctor, do I need the purple one, do I wanna get some clams? I don't know if I'm gonna get to every act of kindness. Let me share with you a story. It's a story that I included in The Power of Intention. It's a story that I want to share here with you today. It is one of the most beautiful, and it's a true story as well. It goes like this. I call it the Shia story. In Brooklyn, New York, this is titled, Where is God's Perfection? In Brooklyn, New York, Chush, C-H-U-S-H, -S Chush, is a school that caters to learning disabled children. Some children remain in Chush for their entire school career, while others can be mainstreamed into conventional schools. At a Chush fundraising event, a dinner, the father of a Chush child delivered a speech that would never be forgotten by all who attended. After extolling the school and its dedicated staff, he cried out, where is the perfection in my son Shia? Everything God does is done with perfection, but my child cannot remember facts and figures as other children do. Where is God's perfection here? The audience was shocked by the question and pained by the father's anguish and stilled by the piercing query. I believe, the father answered, that when God brings a child like Shia into the world, the perfection that he seeks is in the way people react to this child. He then told the following story about his son Shia. One afternoon, Shia and his father 
walk past a park where some boys Shia knew were playing baseball. Shia asked his father, do you think they'll let me play? Shia's father knew that his son was not at all athletic and that most boys wouldn't even want him on their team, but Shia's father understood that if his son was chosen to play, it would give him a sense of belonging. And as you know, Maslow's highest level of consciousness is on that pyramid is a feeling of belonging. And Shia never felt that way. Shia's father approached one of the boys on the field and asked if Shia could play. The boy looked around for some guidance from his teammates and getting none, he took matters into his own hands and he said, well, we're losing by six runs and the game is in the eighth inning. I guess he can be on our team and we'll try to put him up to bat in the ninth inning. Shia's father was ecstatic as Shia smiled broadly. Shia was told to put on a glove and go out to play in center field. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Shia's team scored a few runs, but they were still behind by three. In the bottom of the ninth inning, Shia's team scored again, and now with two outs and the bases loaded, Shia was scheduled to be up with the potential winning run on base. Would the team actually let Shia bat at this juncture of the game and give away their chance to win? Surprisingly, Shia was given the bat. Everyone knew that it was all but impossible because Shia didn't even know how to hold a bat, let alone hit with it. However, as Shia stepped up to the plate, the pitcher moved in a few steps so he could lob the ball in softly so that Shia would at least be able to make contact with the ball. The first pitch came in, Shia swung clumsily and he missed. And then one of Shia's teammates came up out of the dugout and together, he and Shia held the bat and faced the opposing pitcher waiting for the next pitch, the two of them. The pitcher again took in a few more steps toward Shia so he could toss the ball even more softly. And as the pitch came in, Shia and his teammate together swung the bat and together they hit a slow ground ball to the pitcher. The pitcher picked up the soft grounder and could easily have thrown the ball to the first baseman. Shia would have been out and that would have ended the game. But instead, the pitcher took the ball and threw it on a high arc to right field, far beyond the reach of the first baseman. Everyone started yelling, Shia, Shia, run to first, run to first. Never in his life had Shia run to first. He scampered down the baseline, wide-eyed and startled. By the time he reached first base, the right fielder had the ball, and he could have thrown the ball to the second baseman who would tag out Shia, who was still running. <laughs> but the right fielder understood what the pitcher's intentions, intentions were. So he threw the ball high and far over the third baseman's head. Everyone yelled, run to second, Shia, run to second. Shia ran toward second base as the runners ahead of him deliriously circled the bases toward home. As Shia reached second base, the opposing shortstop ran up to him, turned him in the direction of third base, and shouted, run to third, Shia, run to third. As Shia rounded third, the boys from both teams ran behind him screaming, Shia, Shia, run home, run home. Shia ran home, stepped on home plate, and all 18 boys lifted him on their shoulders and made him the hero as he had just hit a grand slam and won the game for his team. That day, said his father, now with soft tears rolling down his face, those 18 boys reached their level of God's perfection. Is that a beautiful story? It always touches me. Creativity, kindness, the first two faces of intention. 
The third face of intention is called simply love. My friend Leo Biscaglia, you remember Leo? Leo, who wrote a book about love and who did many things for public television, two days before he died, he wrote me a beautiful letter and he said, Wayne, just keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right path. And he said, the sun is always shining behind the clouds. Stay connected. That was from my friend Leo Biscaglia, who I hardly knew, but he wrote about love and he talked about it on PBS, oh, many, many years ago, decades ago now. My intention, and I wrote a chapter on this, is called, it is my intention to respect myself at all times. Your view of the world really depends upon how much you respect yourself. How much love do you have for yourself? When you trust in yourself, you're trusting in the same wisdom that created you. When you fail to trust in yourself, when you fail to love yourself, you are denying your own divinity and therefore attracting the exact opposite of what this source is. This is a source of love. It is a source of great respect. It doesn't create anything that it doesn't have a loving feeling toward. If you don't have that feeling of love toward yourself, you can't extend it outward for who can give away what they don't have for themselves? Who can do that? I've often used the metaphor of an orange. If you squeeze an orange, you get out of it orange juice. Why? It's an orange. That's what's inside. And when you squeeze you, someone puts pressure on you, says something about you that you don't like, and out of you comes anger and hatred and bitterness and tension and fear and anxiety and depression and worry and stress. It's not because of who did the squeezing. It's not because of the instrument they used or the timing. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what's inside. If you don't have love for yourself, you're not trusting in the wisdom that created you. And the idea of being able to respect yourself at all times, how do you go about doing this? You spend your life in a state of cooperation rather than competition. You see yourself as someone who is love in action. It's one of the things that I have written on my return address when I write someone uh, back. It, it says that it'll have my name and then the address, and it, above my name it says, love in action. That's what you have to be, love in action. You, you suggest to yourself and you say these words to yourself, I am whole, I am perfect as I was created. I am whole and I am perfect as I was created. And I came from a source that not only determined the shape of my eye and the shape of my body and the color of my skin and my height, but I came from a source that had a great idea about who I should be as well. And you sense that. And that cannot be fulfilled, it cannot be actualized, it cannot be created if you are not in a state of love. Now, when are you not in a state of love? Whenever you judge another human being, you do not define them with your judgment. You define yourself as someone who needs to judge. If I call you stupid, that does not make you stupid. That makes me a person who has to put labels on other people. And as Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, once said, once you label me, you negate me. Match game, match game. Are my thoughts in harmony with that source from which I emanated? Because, folks, when they are, the right people will show up. And the right events will transpire. And everything that you need in what Carl Jung called synchronicity, that there is almost like what happens when you are in a state of love, 
and not having resistance to that, there is like a collaboration with fate. So judging anybody else just says, I need to judge. It doesn't make them what they are. And all I can say to you, each and every one of you, about love and loving yourself is this, that true nobility, true nobility, is not about being better than anyone else. It's about being better than you used to be. It's about being better than you used to be. All I can say to you up here as I speak to you now at this age, that I'm not better than one person out there watching or one person here in this beautiful theater. But I know for certain that I'm better than I used to be in almost every, not in almost, in every single way that that can be measured. I know that. I know that as a human being, as a writer, as a father, as a grandfather, as whatever it is that I am in my life, I am better than I used to be. Be love. The fourth face of intention is the face of beauty. Here we have a source. Here we have a source that is ultimate truth. It is the source from which you emanated. It's invisible. It's formless. Particles themselves do not create more particles. You need this to create a particle. And here is one of the most beautiful quotes about beauty, written by one of the people who probably knows as much about beauty as anybody. His name was Michelangelo. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Florence and you've seen David. I mean, just to stand in the same room. I went there to just look at David. I had no idea that David was 18 feet tall. And that I stood there not for 20 minutes. My whole family went traveling all over Florence. I said, come back. I can't leave. I was mesmerized by the beauty. And I always loved what Michelangelo said when they asked him, how could, out of one piece of marble, how could you create something so beautiful? And he said, David was already in there. I just chipped away the excess. David is in you. Beauty is in you. And here's what he said about beauty. He said, every beauty which is seen here below, down here below, by persons of perception resembles more than anything else that celestial source from which we all come. <laughs> Isn't that great? Every beauty that we see resembles more than anything else that source. We're talking about source, connecting to source, from which we all come. Do you see beauty? Do you see it more or less in your life? Can you find it in a homeless person urinating on the street? Can you find beauty in a cockroach? As you reach higher levels of consciousness, you begin to see, not only do you see beauty everywhere and in everything, you begin to recognize it as truth. One of my favorite quotes that I wrote about, and years ago I wrote a book called Wisdom of the Ages. And it was a collection of 60 essays. We did a public television special on it, and many of you uh, watched it and contributed to PBS from it. And there was a young man, a Victorian poet, in, um, in England named John Keats. He died at the age of 24. He wrote thousands of poems, many, many essays, 24. And he said these words, and I wrote an essay about it 